But I wanted to take this message to share about this trip. Um, if you don't know the background, there was a chief named Chitondo in this very remote part of northern Zambia. People were, were dying, and he credited it to witchcraft and went to the government, said, can you please do something? And they said, we can't help you, but we'll send you to the church. And, and he went and got saved at, by a pastor that we know. And the next thing you know, they call me and they say, could you come? Chief Chitonda wants us to help him turn his tribe from witchcraft to Jesus. And so this is what we spent the first three weeks of September. And among the others, there was Chris and Heidi Cohn. Of course, that's my daughter and son-in-law, and they're four boys. And they now have a ministry there. They live there called Orchard. And there was also Whiteson. You saw him. And he's on the staff of Orchard. They're doing such a great job. By the way, I called this message today how to take down big rats because you heard a little bit about that. The other part was when we first arrived, uh, the first night you could hear it as you lay down there all in the sea and filled with rats, you know. And they had asked us to bring some traps. Well, we saw a miracle. Can you believe we caught 31 rats? And by the end, there was no more rat noise. I didn't know that that was prophetic, that we were going to go to the land of rat and take out the rat. Hallelujah. The rats of disease and death and insecurity. God's there. And how many are here glad that Jesus can take down your rats? All right. And so it was amazing. And I, I hesitated to take a whole sermon on this. I don't want to come across the idea of, let me tell you about the great spiritual feats of your pastor. In fact, I thought, oh, I don't even want to tell them that. But what I felt deeply was the Lord was saying, no, this is not about that. This is about the Holy Spirit telling me that he wants to use what happened there to increase the faith of every one of you. That he wants to bring a fresh fire. When, when I last left Chitondo, the pastors called me and said, there's fire Revival fire is burning across Chitondo. And I felt like the Lord said, Dale, this is heart for the world's inheritance. Even now to have a fresh fire, a fresh anointing to share Jesus with the nations and the neighborhood. You know, I found there's something about testimonies. When you share a testimony, often God transfers faith. Oh, I believe God could do that for me. I remember when I was just five years old, my grandmother reading me these storybooks of, of Susie Graham, missionary in Africa, this little girl. And I remember five years old, maybe I'll go to Africa someday. I believe God could sow a seed for someone, even as you listen, of faith and miracles. As I said, if you know anything about this church, this is a call for a church that's going to change the nations. And, and I never felt more on a trip like all of you were there, that we were a body, that we were a team. The prayers and everything was so incredible. And, and we could sense this is us. This is who we are. And this is God's favor upon us. And I really sense the Lord emphasizing just to, to retell the body that this is your inheritance. And that together we're so much more than apart, you know, that with one, we can put to flight 1,000. Two, we can put to flight 10,000. And that as we come together, there, there was this vision. Some of you know, when we started this church, I was going to be a missionary to the Philippines. I was going to leave. And God said, no, I've got a better plan. I want you to go to Las Cruces. And, and I've got a plan, not just for a missionary, but to raise up a church that shows what it is to have a heart for the world, a church for the nations that doesn't give the leftovers to the lost and the least in the nations, but gives the first fruits to God for the nations and goes places where the lost and the least who've never heard, like in Chitondo, where they've never heard the name of Jesus, so many of them, and go to the people living on $2 less a day in that place where there's only one well for 10,000 people and there's lacking clean water and there's disease that's rampant, but to go to the very last people on the planet, but to go as a church and see God do great things. And he said, boy, if you'll build my house in the nations, there'll always be a house for you back home. Like the little boy who gave his loaves and fishes, the Lord says, just give your first fruit to the nations and you will have 12 baskets left over. And that's been our testimony. Hallelujah. 
And, and there was sort of a picture of this team effort that I felt I wanted to give you. And, and it's the idea that together we let down the rope. And I want to show a little clip because this, as I said, there's three things I want to say in my testimony that God did in me that I believe he wants to do in you today. Number one is confirm our calling. Number two, expand our faith. And number three, receive and impart a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, and this confirming of the calling was, again, I remember literally the first mission trip I ever made to the Philippines, 1987. And when God was pointing me how it would be a church that would, would rescue, it wouldn't be one person. And I got back from the mission trip, and on the news was the story. Someone here might, if you're old like me, you would remember little baby Jessica who fell in a pipe in Midland, Texas, was down there for days and took this whole village, this whole world almost, to rescue her. So let's just watch this, because this, this speaks prophetically to us. And I remember the Lord says, you may go or others, but you'll just be the one at the bottom of the rope. And it'll be the effort of a whole church. Believing God that will create change, that will lock up gates of hell, after all the lost people are out, and that we will celebrate. And today, I want you to know we're rejoicing. There's at least seven to 900 names of people whose names are now written in the book of life from Chitondo who met Jesus because of our faith and our prayers. There's, the cones are going to continue. They're going back to change. There's 10 church plants we did. They're going to work to get wells and, and help fertilizer for the people because their crops, you know, and, and all of this because the church says, hey, let's dare to believe God for something. It's awesome. And I believe in every one of us, God wants to awaken something. You're here to share Jesus in, an, in a deeper way. How many know the only reason that Jesus doesn't rapture us the moment we get saved? Wouldn't that be convenient? You know, oh, you got saved, zap. No backsliders, woo! But, you know, he, he leaves us here because of one thing, to win the lost at any cost, to rescue the baby Jessica people who never heard about a Christmas, to see something bigger than ourselves, and to go for it, and to be a church that, that goes, again, not just on mission trips, you know what I saw, Heidi and Chris, you know, we over here, we go for two weeks, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable 365 days a year for them. And I think of our missionaries, and, and, and was mentioning this in the first one, we had Charles and Zenaida who are in Chihuahua, right in the middle of these drug wars. And you know, we had Ruth Kerr in Peru, and you have these missionaries. And part of the reason we have an organization, you'll hear more about Hartford World International, is because sometimes we forget the people right now every day, and so they're going to bring support and prayers and, and, and cries out to God, and God's going to help them through that. The other thing that was so confirmed was one of the words the Lord gave us was that through each generation, heart for the world, God's anointing would become stronger upon our children. I want you to know there's an impartation and inheritance for the youth and children of this church. And so as I mentioned, it was just awesome to go over there. My daughter, Heidi, and Chris, they're missionaries. But then my four grandchildren, Owen and, and Eli and Liam and Noah. And as soon as I got there, I saw them. I mean, they're praying for the sick. They're doing this. Uh, Eli is now this. If you, in fact, this week on our Facebook page, if you want to see it, you can go to, you'll see Eli Cone Productions. He made a video of all this. But what was really special is that I show up in my five-year-old grandson, Noah. The first thing he wants to tell me, he says, Papa, I can speak in tongues. <laughs> in fact, if you want to show that little clip, I thought this was pretty powerful. Louder. Louder. <laughs> also, in fact, Noah, when I, when I got there, he said, Papa, come. Is it okay if I'd be a grandpa? Just a minute. But anyhow, he goes over there and he's building a puzzle. And he says, Papa, come help me make this puzzle. I said, I'm not very good at puzzles. You know what he said to me? He said, 
Papa, that's a negative declaration. (laughs) Say it with me. You are well able. You can still learn. I just got rebuked by a five-year-old. Wow. But right in the middle of that, I saw them reaching out, evangelizing. And God's spirit says, wait till you see what your kids and grandkids are going to do for me. This team effort so beautifully described in Romans 10, 14. Let's just read this. This describes our church. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You see, those who go, those who sin, we're all part of the same team. God wants to send us, some of us, and some of us, he wants us to support. But we're together. I'm telling you, if you're a heart for the world or you have a a global anointing on your life, (laughs) and maybe some of you say, maybe I better get out of this church. But no, that's what's on you. And what we're claiming for generations A second thing was so powerful was that God showed us that he wants to bring through this time and even through this message, his call to keep stretching and upgrading our faith, to expect bigger, imagine bigger, ask big, and attempt big for God. You know, you don't see the power of God if you stay in your comfort zone. (laughs) If you say, well, I want to reach the world for Jesus, and you're just eating potato chips, you know, I love what uh, Reinhard Bonnke said, you will never meet an anointed couch potato. (laughs) They don't exist. It's not until you're willing to obey the Great Commission, go, go, step out of where you're comfortable, go, try to share the love of Christ. God comes when you do that. When we decided to go for this place, I'm telling you, you talk about a big ass. This Chotondo is an hour and a half away from any place with a store. It's, it's a 30-kilometer place of, of 12 villages, one dirt road. The people are all spread out. Like I said, there's just this one well. When we got there, we're, how are we going to get these? People would have to walk miles to just get to where we were trying to meet. When we got there, just all kinds of opposition. Someone had spread the word that we were atheists coming to put a curse on them. So that didn't help any. (laughs) But through it all, we just said, God, we're going to go get a tribe for Jesus. God loves people to stretch what I call your expectation zone. I don't know what you're expecting God to do tomorrow. It's not big enough. I, I don't know what you're expecting God, but quit Believing in a small God. He's a big God. And he's still going to use your life as much as you stretch your faith to believe it. I loved, Chris shared right after I got off the airplane. The, the, their, their calling is to the Bimba-speaking people of northern Zambia, Luapula province where we went, and southern Congo. Right now, the Democratic Republic of Congo is in all kinds of warfare and conflict. And it's almost impossible for Westerners. If you go in there, I mean, they'll stop you for bribes. They'll take you in. It's unbelievable. And so the Holy Spirit put on Chris and and Owen to say, do this daring thing. And so they went to the embassy of of the Democratic Republic and talked to the deputy ambassador of Congo with this big ask. And they said, we know God wants us to go there. Would you give us papers that get us through all the checkpoints? The deputy says, I'll do better than that. I'm a Christian, hallelujah. And he says, I'm going to give you my cell phone. And anytime you go to Congo, I'm going to call all the checkpoints. I'm going to open the doors. And he said, where, where do you feel led to go? And he says, don't tell me, I know. And he says, Kumba Lulesi, I forget how to say it. <laughs> kind of like Noah speaking in tongues. But anyhow. <laughs> and Chris said, that's exactly what God's Holy Spirit told us to go. God will open doors that no man can shut. And God will use what Satan brings as strongholds to make them Jesus' springboards. <laughs> 
He says, I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so the other way great faith grows, how many know great faith doesn't grow when everything's easy? Great faith grows when you have opposition and trouble. Great faith grows when you're way over your head and you're being spiritually attacked. You see, Jesus doesn't say, go in my name and it will be a rose petal pathway. He says, go in my name and you shall tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the... That means serpents and scorpions are coming after you, buddy. And in this world, you shall have tribulation. But if you're in my name, in faith, not any of these things shall harm you. Greater is he that is in you. Fear no evil, for the Lord is with you. Go in my name and cast out the demons. Go in my name. Like Moses went, I will part the Red Sea. So we started having plenty of opposition. I don't have time to tell you about all of them. But even on that big bus, we get right in the middle. This is a 13-hour grueling journey. And the, the bus breaks down again, and the radiator overheats. I don't know if we have that uh, little picture, but, but uh, right in the middle of that. I don't know if you've ever laid hands on a radiator. You don't get too hot, close. But anyhow... And we poured in a, a, just a couple of things of water. You know what? It stopped. We were on the road again. And then we got to a stopping point, and there was this, this, this I'm just going to have to tell you, he was a drunk police officer. That's all I can say. <laughs> and he did not like Westerners. So he gets on the bus, and he's looking for a fight. And, and Chris gives him a Coke. And he says, oh, you're trying to bribe an officer. I'm taking you guys in. <laughs> and he's trying to start a fight. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, just ask him if you can pray for him. I have a prophetic word for him. I say, sir, can I pray for you? God has something. He goes, whoa, 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 what? So we start to prophesy and pray over him. Afterward, he looks up and he says, and he goes like this, would you please bless my Coke? <laughs> my first... Coke blessing I've ever given. And, well, Jesus blessed fish. I guess I could bless it. And as soon as I did, he goes, and he does the sign of the cross, and he walks off the bus. You're free to go. When we get there, as I said, the opposition, I mean, the second night, somebody sets fires all around the field, like 20, 30 feet. You know, that's, that's fun to preach while the fire's coming. But not a single person was harmed and not a single hut was burned. The next night, it rained, I'm telling you. It was a flood. I don't know if we have any pictures of that, but, but washed everything out. Now, I got to tell you about these people. They were so hungry for God. We couldn't figure it. Finally, the we only thing we were able to rent was dump trucks. And as we drove through, people jumped on these dump trucks. I'm telling you, they were hanging over elderly people. And in spite of the rain, they came. And, and I said, what are we going to do now? And they ran into the cover. We had a tent, and we had a place near some little school rooms. And in spite of the rain, they huddled in there, and, and Bernabe and Chris and all of us went and shared the gospel in the middle of this torrential flood and half the people accepted Jesus right there in spite of the rain. Hallelujah. If you ever have ministered in a demonic place, you know, witchcraft, you know, there'll be these manifestations of demons. I'm talking people just falling out, blood curdling screams. We had to have a tent. We carried these people. And it was like something like a Civil War movie where they're cutting off legs. I mean, the, the screams were horrendous. Little children even slithering like snakes under the control of demons. One lady I started to pray for, she just went out. I mean, like she was dead. I couldn't arouse her. I couldn't wake her. She just had a little pulse. They had to carry her out. And I mean, this was happening by the dozens and the dozens, these people. But I want you to know, through much toil and late into the night, every single person was delivered from their demons. Hallelujah. And we got to that first night, and, 
You know, again, people didn't know how to respond. They hadn't heard the gospel. So, you know, we have a worship team, and they're all just hiding, walking away, and they thought we were going to curse them, so they're hiding behind the trees, except for the children. You saw them. And, and so I give the gospel message, and then the Lord says, and I just feel it so deeply, they have to see the power of God. How many know that when, when you're places where you can hardly communicate, where there's, you can't do this with the cool evangelistic methods that you learned in seminary. You have to have God show up. And so I'm saying, you know, I'm, fa- I'm praying my favorite prayer. Oh God, oh God, help me, God. My legs are rubber. I'm profusely sweating. I feel major panic attack. That's the anointing. Anyhow, I'm feeling all of this. And I said, God, you got to. And I said, now we're going to have prayer for the sick. Put your hand where you feel pain right now. And I said, God, give me some words. And all of a sudden, first one, it's kind of strange, woman with the issue of blood. I knew that didn't come for me. All these women in deep pain began to be touched by the Holy Spirit. And then, then about deaf ears, and one of the incredible ones was this, I, the Lord was healing eyes, and this one guy comes up and he says, you know, I couldn't see, but when you prayed, I can start to see out of this left eye. But he challenged me because he said, I can see a little better, but I want to see perfect. <laughs> and so he said, pray for me again in front of everybody. How many know it's okay to put God on the spot? <laughs> And as we prayed, the presence of the Lord came. I had Bernabe come over, and he held up his, his cell phone, and he said, can you read these texts? And he could read them perfectly. He has better eyes than I do now. Hallelujah. And then if you could see this picture of Chris and Heidi, they prayed for this little boy who came, carried by his parents. He could not walk. And they literally just held him up and prayed. At the end of the crusade, I watched them, the little boy, walk back, healed to his village. One woman who's now a church planner, she came. I found her and her other friends on the road. They lived about five miles from where we were meeting. Her one friend was an elderly lady. and She was so sick that, the, that we picked her up in the bus, but the whole time she was throwing up. She couldn't stop throwing up, but she says, I'm going to get there because Jesus is going to heal me. And this woman, her husband was, was limping. He had a cane. After the service, he was healed. And she announced that she was going to start a church in her home. And she gave us this big, giant bag of cassava, which is what they grow there. She says, I am so thankful Jesus has come to touch my life. One of the third things I just mentioned is that God used this time to show us that he wants us to receive a new impartation of the Holy Spirit and to give that impartation to other people. This is, as I said, so huge because here in the West, in America, I find Christians love to talk and give an explanation of the Holy Spirit. But in Africa, they're not worried about an explanation. They want an experience of the Holy Spirit. Because if he doesn't show up, their kids are going to die and they'll never get free of demon spirits. And so there was this desperation. And we're praying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I, I, I need you to come, Holy Spirit. And this became so big in my heart. I didn't realize this would become sort of a central part of this entire church. And this would be the message the Lord wants me to bring to you today. He doesn't want you to just hear about things God does. He wants to bring fresh fire. How many know it's not enough to have cultural Christianity? To come to church, be religious, and go home. The Bible says there's people in the last day They have a form of godliness, but they don't have the power. They don't have dominion over their personal sins. They don't see Jesus moving through their life in supernatural ways. And I began to realize this is the inheritance of the children of God. And I would dare say that not one of us has even tapped into 5% of the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us through Jesus Christ. Are you satisfied 
with how much you're filled with the Holy Spirit? I hope not. God has upgrades. He has activations. He has fresh anointings. He has measures of faith for every mess in your life. You need the Holy Spirit to give you a new measure of faith. For every problem, you need a power encounter that says, I'm in this problem. Watch me move. For every struggle, you don't just need to get smarter and try harder. You need the spirit of the living God to come. He's stronger than addictions. The spirit breaks the yoke. He's stronger than what's going on in your kids. Some of you don't even realize how the demons are attacking them. But the spirit of the Lord upon you will show you discernment and just take those things out through prayer. We need a supernatural power of anointing in our life. And I'm here to say there's more. How many of you are settling? I remember when, reading a story when electricity first came to rural America. This one lady signed up for electricity. And, and they noticed the electric company after months that she really hadn't used it. And so they sent someone out and says, do you really understand electricity? Are you using the electricity? She says, yes, sir, I am. Every night I turn on the lights to light my candles. And spend the rest of the night. How many of you have the electric power of the almighty God and all you're doing is turning on the lights so you can light the candle and you can keep living in your own power? He's here today. I remember when I got there, I began to pray, Lord, this is too big for me. And I was reading a book by Reinhard Bonnke. If you don't know him, you know, he's an evangelist who led over 5 million people to Jesus in Africa through signs and wonders. And I said, Lord... I'm asking, give me that mantle. And the Lord spoke to me at night, and he said, I just want you to know that I'm going to touch 10,000 10, African people with a an mantle and anointing greater than Reinhard Bonnke. I said, well, that's pretty interesting. And so I get there, and I'm preaching, and my interpreter is this guy named Kennedy. And he looks up at me, and he says, Pastor Dale, I've had this craziest thing from the time I was a little child that somehow I'm going to do what you're doing and I'm going to do it for stadiums of people. I said, ooh, there's the first one. <laughs> and so in the next, we had to go into a meeting. I go into the meeting. In the middle, the Holy Spirit says, now impart to him. How many know Paul said, I can't wait to get to Rome so I can impart to you more spiritual gifts? And so in the middle of it, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said, so I said, stand up, Kennedy. I impart to you in the name of Jesus the anointing and power to preach the gospel and signs and wonders to thousands of people throughout Africa. All of a sudden, poo, he just flies back three, three rows. The Spirit of God was moving on him. And the Lord said, I want to do this, and I want you to tell the people. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. This is a really important verse. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Somebody say, fan into flame. Which is in you through the laying on of my hands. The spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. Somebody say, power. Love and self-discipline. See, the Bible says the spirit of God is in you. But you are only allowing a spark. It's time to stir it up. He wants a forest fire in you. You see, when Moses went, God described to him, what is it like to have the presence of God? He says, look at this bush. It burns. God doesn't just want you to have more religion. He wants you to have fire. <laughs> fire. Fire that's going to give you dominion over those secret sins. Fire that's going to use you to share Christ in ways that people, they come under conviction. Just being around you, you walk into a place and the demons start having nervous breakdowns because the anointing is up on your life. Somebody say, I want some of that. I want the power. And this is your inheritance, friends. This will be in chapter 26. I just need to read this since, since you're going to be studying. Let's just read John 14, 12. Jesus is trying to comfort his disciples before he goes. And he says, truly, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things. Somebody say greater things. Than these 
because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything. Somebody say anything. In my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he will be with you, and he will be in you. Somebody say, in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come. And Jesus says, what I want you to know is that when I leave, when I send my Holy Spirit, I will replicate the ministry that I have had through you, if you'll let me. I don't want my ministry of healing and raising the dead to stop. So I'm going to send an executor, the Holy Spirit, who comes to enforce my authority and power. And he's not going to just be around you. He's going to be inside of you. And when you release his power in my name, things are going to happen. Inside of you. You don't have to search for the Holy Spirit. You just have to uh, release the Holy Spirit. You just have to appropriate the Holy Spirit. You just have to activate. You just have to let him stir you up. I don't know how to describe it. Maybe it's like chocolate milk when you first pour the syrup in. You got the chocolate in you, but you need to stir it up, brother. <laughs> what good is it if, it, if, it's, if it's there, but it's not manifesting in your life? And the Lord said, even today, it's going to empower. When Heidi began to minister to the women, they were so oppressed. She, in authority, began to break the spirits off of them and impart to them confidence and dignity. You should have seen these women rise up. I don't know, is it Burnaby here? But he ministered to the children. Come on up. Tell us what happened when you ministered. This is Burnaby. He came with me, he was awesome. Well, they told me to give a little testimony about the trip, but oh man, there's so many things that happened. It was so amazing. But this one day we were teaching about uh, with the kids. We had one hour before the, the crusade started. We were with, with the kids. And you because kids, well, 150, 200 kids would gather around. We'd be playing games with them, running and playing with balloons. A single balloon will make them so happy. Oh man, it was so amazing. And then after the games, we go to a classroom. And then in a classroom, imagine, 150 kids, 200 sitting in just one classroom. The, the desk was right there, kids sitting four by the desk and the chairs and then the floor, everything was packed, just really, really packed. And we were teaching this one day about Jesus praying for his disciples and said, you guys are ready, go, you've learned. Go and preach the gospel. Go and pray for the sick. Go and find someone who has a spirit in them and they will be delivered. So go and do it. And so they went, the, the disciples went and when they came back, they were so amazed, like, wow, we've been praying for the sick and they have been healed. How we've been praying for people who have been oppressed and they are free. So we told the little children, the same thing that happened years ago in the Bible is going to happen today because Jesus sent us here to you. So how many of you are in pain right now? Lift up your hands. And about 15 hands went up. Okay, so let us pray. And simple kids word, God, please take away my pain. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you still have pain? Only five hands. So that meant already God started to move right there, right? Only five hands. Okay, let's pray again. God, take away my pain in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have pain? Only one hand. So we took that little kid, we brought him to the front of the class and said, you know what, but he doesn't stop with us, the teachers. In you, there's the same power that was with Jesus and the disciples. So you, little, ki little kids, stretch your hands to your friend and pray for him. Say, God, please take away the, pray the pain of my friend. Are you still in pain? And with a big smile, he says, no. And then you should have seen the, the, the smiles in the other kids that were raising their hands up to, the, to his friends. They were like, wow, wow, I prayed and he's healed. So that's something so amazing. And one more thing I want to tell you about this trip. Since I was a little kid, they would uh, ask my friends in the classroom, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's five, me, five, five years old I'm right there. 
What do you want to be when you grow up? And of course you say, fireman, a policeman, a doctor, a pilot. Bernabe, what do you want to be when you grow up? A missionary in Africa. So, man, that, this trip meant so, so much to me. Thank you very much. I'm sitting. Awesome. For me, the most amazing impartation was with Chief Chitondo. He's such a mild, mild man. Brand new Christian. Got to lay hands for the Holy Spirit. I said, do you want to say anything? The crusade. He says, yes, I do. When you got up, I tell you, when he got up, and you could barely hear it. We showed it, but it was too muffled. But he was like a lion. I mean, he got up and he said, my people, this is the time for us to become a tribe for Jesus. And he began to preach and he began to, to say, you know, the Bible says if we, if we confess our sin, turn from our wicked ways, God will hear our prayers and he will heal our land. And he poured out that water. And he began to confess the sins of the people. God, forgive us for our, for our, our, our unbelief, our witchcraft, our idolatry. Just began to cry out. The place became so quiet. We could hear a pin drop. And that's when I gave the invitation with the rope. And a tribe came. I met with the 10, 14 that said they would be church planners. I'm so excited because Chris and Heidi are going back there for five days of training and to pastor that. But as they sat there, they were so eager, we gave them the quilt. And this is something very special. It's an impartation gift, and you saw it in the video. And I said, we have prayed over this, and you by faith can claim healing every time you see this. And then I, as I gave it to them, I told them, see this verse on here. 45 years ago, when I'm a young teenager, Jesus called me to the ministry. And he gave me this verse, Acts 26, 18. I'm sending it to them to turn them from Satan, the power of Satan to God, from darkness to light, that they might receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. And in that night, I saw a vision of thousands of people walking over a cliff with blindfold. And Jesus said, your life, I'm sending you. Go take off the blindfold and point them. And, and in that dream, Jesus appeared. And as they moved towards Jesus, they were freed. And I told them, listen, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. But every person who accepts Christ, you know, a Christian without a church is an orphan without a family. They need you to open homes and churches. And they need you. And I, I, I don't know, they're not all saved. But how many of you will promise me that you will take the mantle now and every person in Chitonda will hear the gospel and they all just roared, I will do it. And we prayed over them. And the Spirit came. We gave them these proclaimers, which are audio Bibles in the Bimba language. We found out that over half of them could not read. And when they heard that they could listen to the Bible, they were, you mean I can have the word of God and, and just listen. And it's solar powered so it never runs out of matter. And then I'm going to get to preach. And then the joy of that. One of them got so excited. We showed the picture of Maxim. But this one guy, he says, I'm going. Please pick me up on the way home. I'm telling you, we don't know what happened to this guy because we drove to pick him up. And it was well over 30, 45 minutes. We called him Brother Flash. I don't know what he did. But he was so excited, he went all the way, five miles, and he met us at the side of the road with a big cluster of bananas that he cut to say, thank you, thank you, I will take the gospel, and I will plant a church in Jesus' name. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> we got to impart to the, de de the deputy commissioner, the governor of the whole region, went to his office. To the head of agriculture who said, we will help you in any way to see that the people could get the fertilizer. We just went everywhere commissioning. To the chief, they've got chiefs, and then they got the chief of chief chiefs. Yeah. Chief Kazimbe. We got favor with him, and Chris is going and asked, can I train chaplains for the entire region of Kazimbe? But here's what I want you to know. This isn't for Africa. This is for you. 
God wants you to expect and our church to expect a fresh empowerment, a fresh anointing, a, a sense that God could use me at any moment that if I'm willing to share Jesus, that's all that a missionary is, is someone who shares what Jesus did for you. And if you're willing to do that, God wants to bring power. These signs shall accompany those. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. They shall cast out demons. He wants to bring authority. Some of you, there's gifts he's stirring up. And this is huge. Some of you, there is a gift of faith and you cannot handle your problems at the measure of faith you have right now. And he says, I got more faith. And if you will let me, I will stir you. As I said, for every mess, and you need a greater measure. <laughs> Some of you, it's a gift of wisdom. Some of you in your business, God has a divine anointing to take that business to somewhere you can never imagine. Don't do it by might or by power, but by the spirit of the living God. Some of you, it's an area of discernment. Some of you, it's intercession, teaching, healing, whatever it is. But I'm telling you, you don't have to just have the level you have. There's more. There's upgrades. There's more anointing. There's more power. You haven't seen anything yet. The Spirit in these last days will be poured out on all flesh. Even your sons and daughters shall prophesy. There's an anointing for you today. So we just stand to your feet as we close the service, and I wonder how many would just ask and say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I want more. Holy Spirit, I believe that you are in me if I've had accepted Jesus. And I do not want to limit you. Oh, Holy Spirit, I am desperate for you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that I will be filled to the boiling point. As I got ready to preach, I said, Lord, warm water, lukewarm water, even hot water won't do. I need to be boiling. Would you turn up the fire in my spirit until steam comes out of my ears? And when my words are spoken, they're on fire and they go like firebrands into the heart. And God says, Stale, you can stay that way. You can be on fire. Don't just get close to the fire, friend. Jesus is telling you, jump in the fire and don't leave. His anointing is here. And just ask him, release your presence in me, Holy Spirit. I believe that the same works Jesus did, I'm supposed to do in greater works. And I'm telling you, if anyone here is willing to share the gospel and share Jesus, he wants to give you more anointing to do that. I guarantee you, it's in the Word of God. So Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fill me. Today, let it all be released. Gifts of healing, discerning of spirits. Let authority over places where our sin has had dominion. Let the fruit of the Spirit come like power. Self-control come crush those addictions. I have not received a spirit of timidity. I am not an addict. I have received a spirit of self-discipline. I have authority over my flesh, over my fears, and over every demon that's in my family line, and I crush them in Jesus' name. And I receive authority to walk in freedom and peace and love and joy and holiness and godliness and in power, influence, and wisdom. Someone receiving right now a mighty gift of discerning of spirits to see where the demons are attacking and to cast them out. A spirit of faith, anointing of leadership, anointing for business, anointing for intercession. I want it, Holy Spirit. 